Namaskar, good afternoon. Welcome everyone. Welcome to Brookings India. We are very excited uh, for the development seminar today. We have a high-powered panel of economists uh, across the spectrum. <clears throat> and uh, we are very excited to have uh, Batran Gross, who's going to present the World uh, Economic Outlook, a, a publication of the IMF. Uh, and uh, Batran's going to present Manufacturing Jobs, Implications for Productivity and Inequality. And after he makes his presentation, we will have two distinguished uh, discussants, uh, Montek Singh Aluwalia and Ajit Ranade. Uh, and then we will request our guest of honor, uh, Bibek Debroy, uh, to make his uh, comments. And then we have some time at the end for some Q&A. So Batran, if I may request, uh, you have half an hour to make your presentation. So thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you for receiving me here at Brookings. It's a pleasure. Um, so this is one of the chapters of the World Economic Outlook. Uh, the World Econom Economic Outlook comes out twice per year. Uh, the first chapter is on prospe global prospects and policies of the global economy. And then it has a sequence of analytical chapters. This is chapter three on manufacturing jobs and the, in particular the decline of manufacturing employment and the implications it may have for uh, productivity, income per capita, and, uh, and inequality. So let me get started, and let me show you a key observation that has attracted attention. And that is that manufacturing uh, appears to be fading as a source of uh, jobs. The, this chart shows um, the share of manufacturing aggregate employment from a broad set of advanced economies, which is shown in red and uh, a set of emerging market and developing economies, shown in blue. The line denotes the simple average, the shading area, the interquartile range of the manufacturing employment shares. And we can see that the share of manufacturing jobs has been steadily declining in advanced economies over the past four or five decades. In fact, it has declined in every single advanced economy we have in the sample. While in emerging market and developing economies, the share of manufacturing employment has been much more stable. It actually has level, tended to level off at relatively low levels. That's the, the, the most rem remarkable, remarkable fact. There are some exceptions, and we all know that um, manufacturing in China is still expanding, and it's currently reaching a level of around uh, 20%. But most developing countries have seen a flat uh, level of, of manufacturing. So there are two concerns that have been ri raised regarding this observation. For developing economies, the concern is that uh, the sector seems to be, the employment in the sector seems to be peaking at a much lower level than in economies that developed earlier. A phenomenon that Danny, Roderick, and others have uh, called premature deindustrialization, but actually in most developing countries, rather than a deindustrialization, is a lack of industrialization to start with. This chart, this chart shows, for example, on the vertical axis, the maximum uh, man, uh, manufacturing employment share attained by each country since the 60s or 70s, and in the horizontal axis, the level of income per capita at which that uh, maximum is attained. And we can see that developing countries that are shown in blue tend to be towards the, the bottom of the chart and towards the left of the chart, so at lower levels and at lower income, income per capita. What is the concern on this? Well, Productivity in advanced countries typically tended to slow when resources started to switch from manufacturing to services. That's something that was first raised by, by Bomol several decades ago. Uh, we also know that the countries that managed to reduce income gaps with advanced countries quite rapidly, like Korea, went through a process of manufacturing expansion in employment and in exports. Um, we also know that productivity in manufacturing tends to converge to the global frontier. That is, it grows faster where it is relatively low, which means that it provides an, an escalator for productivity in the sector and for the economy as a whole. But there's li little proof of what happens in the rest of the economy out of manufacturing. And uh, for the economy as a whole, typically we don't find evidence of unconditional convergence. So the concern is that skipping uh, a traditional industrialization phase will imply slower income per capita growth and will affect the, the 
possibilities of developing countries to catch up with income levels in advanced countries. Now, of course, the out of manufacturing, the set of activities are very diverse, and that's something that we are going to look in this in this chapter in more detail. There is also a concern, as I mentioned, uh, mainly for advanced uh, countries where manufacturing jobs are disappearing altogether, so they are declining in absolute terms, that this may, imp may contribute to an increasing in income inequality. The reason is that the sector typically provided a uh, large number of jobs, well-paying jobs for relatively unskilled workers. So the, the observation there is that in countries that tended to have that, that tended to experience a relatively large decline in the manufacturing employment share, aggregate inequality increased. This could reflect, for instance, that middle-skilled workers that are displaced from manufacturing end up taking low-skilled jobs, low-paid jobs in, uh, in, in, uh, in the service sector that leads to a hollowing out of the income distribution and increasing inequality. But it could also reflect that uh, those countries just have been more exposed to other trends that tend to rise inequality on the aggregate. So with that background, the chapter uh, does three things. First, is it uh, looks at the stylus facts. It uh, takes stock of what has been going on uh, on manufacturing activity, both at the global and country level over the last decades. But then in turn, it turns to uh, revisit the evidence that is behind those two concerns I mentioned. First, it seeks to answer whether skipping a traditional industrialization phase would affect, the, would hurt aggregate productivity growth and income convergence prospects of the European countries. Uh, and this is the part that we'll focus most today because I think it's more, more relevant for this audience. The last part of the chapter explores whether labor earnings in manufacturing are higher and more evenly distributed than in, than in services, and also tries to see to what extent the decline in manufacturing jobs may have contributed to an increase in aggregate labor income inequality in advanced, in, in advanced countries. So you saw this before, this slide. Let me see. There we go. A preview of the findings. In terms of Stylus facts, uh, we document that the share of manufacturing in employment and output at the global level has not changed much over the last four or five decades. Uh, but there's a, a lot of differences between different groups of economies, advanced, developing, and across individual countries. Second, uh, our findings suggest that the leveling off of manufacturing at relatively lower levels does not need to hurt growth and income convergence because several service sectors do show uh, high levels and growth rate of productivity. They also show evidence of unconditional convergence to the global frontier, so productivity growing faster where it is relatively low. And also we find that the shift of labor that we have seen over the last 10, 15 years that were primi primarily from agriculture to market service in developing economies contributed positively to aggregate productivity growth. This does not mean that growth and convergence is guaranteed, but, but it suggests that the, the, a lower role of manufacturing does not need to hurt necessarily. The last part, in terms of uh, inequality implications for advanced countries, we find that uh, although labor earnings are a bit higher and a bit better distributed in, in, in uh, manufacturing than services, the, most of the change in aggregate inequality that we saw in advanced countries has been driven for changes in all sectors. So it's not due to reallocation of labor, but more to changes uh, in, in all individual sectors. So let me give you a quick preview of the stylus facts. As I mentioned before, at the global level, the, the importance of manufacturing has been relatively unchanged. The, the sector still employs the same share of the global workforce that they did in the 70s. That's shown by the blue line that is relatively horizontal in this chart. In terms of output, the share of manufacturing has also been relatively stable when measured at constant prices. That's the yellow line and had, uh, has actually increased a little bit over the last uh, decade or so. But this stability uh, mask a bit of uh, an important difference across different groups of countries. In developing countries, as I said, showed in the first slide, the share of manufacturing in employment has been declining steadily, and the share of manufacturing in output has been relatively stable during this, this, this period. In, and in, instead, developing economies as a group experience a sharp increase both in employment and output shares, but that reflects to a large extent the role of some large economies, and notably China. When you remove China, the evolution is much more stable. There's also a lot of difference 
across individual economies. Uh, in, this, in this chart, we are showing the average annual change in the employment and the output share. And we see that, for example, in the group of developing eco economies that you have on the right, there's a lot of, there's important difference. There are some countries that have experienced sharp contractions in the employment share of manufacturing, other uh, developing countries that have experienced over this whole period an important expansion, uh, Thailand, Malaysia, China, etc. In the chapter we devote, uh, we devote a bit of the chapter to discussing what may be the reasons and provide some evidence, but I will, I will largely skip that in the sake of, uh, of time. The other uh, important uh, transformation over the last decades has been the sharp increase in the uh, share of service employment. Sh service employment has increased everywhere. In advanced economies, this reflects that the, is, is this flip side of the de decline in, in uh, manufacturing employment. That's the top panel you have there. The yellow bars represent the share of service employment. In, uh, in developing countries, instead, what has been going on is that labor has been shifting from agriculture to service, largely bypassing the manufacturing, manufacturing uh, sector. The other thing that we uh, document is that within services, uh, there has been an important expansion of market services. Market, Non-market services are the government, public administration, defense, but also uh, education and, uh, and the health sector. All other services are market services. In developed countries, non-market services expanded importantly. They account for one third of the expansion. But in developing countries, more than 80% of the expansion of service employment is on market service industries. And this is important because those uh, industries tend to perform better in terms of uh, productivity. So what does the decline in, in uh, manufacturing employment or the faster rise in service employment imply for productivity and per capita income growth? I mean, the key question is whether there are some non-manufacturing activities and in particular some service activities that can perform a similar role to manufacturing in terms of driving productivity growth. We follow contributions in the literature and we focus on, on labor productivity as the normative benchmark of the analysis in this section. But we extend the, the analysis to extend possible to look at total factor productivity. And we do three things in this part of the exercise. The first thing is that we use um, granular data to compare productivity growth rates across disaggregated manufacturing and services subsectors to extend possible, to extend that the data allows. We then look at whether the recent shift in employment across sectors have uh, tended to benefit or, ha or hurt aggregate productivity growth. And finally, in the last part of this subsection, we uh, examine whether productivity convergence across countries is uh, unique to manufacturing or is something that is also found in some service sectors. So let me start by the first, by the first part. This, this chart uh, plots the difference uh, in the growth rate of labor productivity between manufacturing and the service sector as a whole, so taking all services together. And um, we know that over a long period of time, this shows data from the, since the 60s, uh, the average productivity growth of labor productivity growth of manufacturing has been larger than in services. But what we see also is that during the recent period after 2000, the difference between the labor productivity growth of the two broad sectors has been shrinking in many economies, in particular in many developing economies. So the distance is, is uh, lower. And in fact, since 2000, uh, labor productivity growth in services has been larger than in manufacturing in several developing economies, including China, India, and several economies in South Saharan Africa. And this is again taking the service sector as a whole, which includes very diverse activities. So when we zoom in uh, and we try to get more detailed information, uh, we find that uh, productivity growth in some services is comparable to the top performing manufacturing industries. In this chart, I'm showing the distribution of average labor productivity growth per decade and per individual manufacturing and service industry. Um, express as deviations from the growth rate uh, of the country and period uh, and at the different levels of disaggregation. I mean, we can, we, when we want to have a very broad representation of countries, which is the first panel, we only have five service subsectors and manufacturing as a whole. 
when we re reduce the number of countries, we can see much more disaggregated data. And if you look at data in the US, we have up to almost 40 individual service up sectors. And we see that the key takeaway is that there's a large overlap. The, the, the distribution of manufacturing is slightly to the right, but there's a lot of overlap. There are several service industries that have productivity growth rate comparable to, to, to top manufacturing services, sorry, industries. The, um, the other uh, aspect that we look is a, a difference in productivity levels, which is important because uh, during structural transformation, as labor shifts from one sector to the other, the difference in the productivity levels will determine to a large extent whether pro uh, structural change boosts pro aggregate productivity or not. And we find, we confirm a few, a few facts. The, in this chart, we are showing the cross-country distribution of the labor productivity in each sector relative to the aggregate economy. And we see that in most countries, agriculture is on the bottom. It has the lowest level of productivity. We see that manufacturing in two thirds of the, of the countries we have, the level of productivity in manufacturing is above the economy wide uh, average. But we see that there are several, there are two at least um, market service subsectors that have relatively high labor productivity. And uh, and if we look, for example, where India stands in this uh, comparison, we see that in, in service sector, it tends to, uh, to score relatively high and relatively low in uh, agriculture productivity. That means in agriculture, labor productivity is particularly far from, from the average and in, in service is, is relatively above. So movements of labor from uh, agriculture, both to manufacturing on or services, will tend to boost uh, aggregate uh, productivity growth. Actually, that is we, what we assess next. We look at uh, how recent shifts in employment have contributed to, to aggregate productivity. We follow the work done by Diao, uh, Macmillan, and Roderick, and we decompose um, aggregate uh, productivity in two components. The first component, which is what we are showing in blue in the right chart, is within sector productivity. So productivity growth within each, each of the sectors in the economy, uh, duly weighted. The second term, which we call structural change, is the contribution to aggregate productivity from the movement of labor across uh, sectors. And what we see is that in, uh, in almost all economies, the contribution of structural change has been positive. The exception is in advanced economies. It's negative, but it's very small. And uh, that, if you look at the left-hand chart, reflects the fact that labor has been moving mostly from manufacturing to services in advanced economies. This is the first block to your left. Uh, and, but among services, labor has tended to shift to non-market services. Uh, instead, in developing in countries, labor has shifted mostly to uh, market services, and the contribution has been uh, positive. That changes contributed positive to a great productivity growth between 2000 and 2010. In some regions, it was particularly large. In, if we put India in perspective, we see that it follows that pattern. Uh, there has been an important expansion of market services during this period, 2000 to 2010. Um, there has been some expansion of other sectors in, in India during this period. I believe this is mostly construction. And structural change uh, during this period, the contribution was, was positive in the case of, uh, of India. Now, the last part of the, of the analysis look at unconditional uh, convergence, convergence across, across, across countries. Because even if labor shifts from low, uh, shifts to relatively high and fast growing um, productivity sectors in the economy, by national standards, that might not be enough to close the gap with the global frontier. So we want to see whether productivity tends to be faster in a, in a sector country where the initial level is relatively low, because that would give an escalator uh, to growth. That has been proven, proved before for manufacturing, uh, but the concern is what happened out of manufacturing, in non-manufacturing sectors. So we test this for each individual subsectors. We are looking for evidence of unconditional convergence. This is a beta convergence regression. Uh, so to keep it simple, what we are looking is we are running a regression at the sectoral level. We are looking for estimates of a beta convergence parameter. We want that parameter to be negative and statistically significant. And that would be reflected on the left-hand side on this chart. So the bars to the left and solid uh, 
are good news in terms of unconditional convergence. And we see that we confirm that manufacturing show, shows evidence of unconditional convergence in a sample of, of 20, 19 advanced economies and 20 developing economies with data since the 60s. But we also find that three market service industries also show evidence of unconditional convergence. Interestingly, the sector that does not show evidence of convergence is agriculture. And given that you know, it still employs half or more of the workforce in many developing economies, that helps to reconcile the fact that many times we don't find evidence of unconditional convergence for the economy as a whole. We, we repeat the analysis for, for, for samples, uh, for, for a, a data that has more granular data, information on manufacturing and services. And, and we find that you know, even within manufacturing, it's not the case that all service industries show evidence of uh, unconditional, sorry, all manufacturing industries show evidence of unconditional convergence. About half don't, like for example, in rubber, food, and other subsectors, they don't show evidence of conditional convergence, but several, and several, several service sectors do find. Okay, so this is, this could be relatively good news for, for developing countries that are uh, bypassing manufacturing. Um, but there are a few challenges, of course. Uh, so one, one concern is that although the uh, service subsector that tended to perform relatively well during the recent past are not small in terms of employment, uh, of the size, in terms of employment share, the ability to expand going forward may be limited by two factors. The first is growth of domestic demand. I mean, services are less tradable than goods. Uh, manufacturing had this uh, nice attribute that you could export your way to development uh, e easily. Services is more complicated. Um, what we, what we, well, we know that the tradability of services is, is smaller than goods, but during the recent past, there has been an important e expansion in the degree of tradability of services. In the, last, in the left chart, uh, you see the change in the share of services in overall exports for a set of um, wide set of countries between 1980 and 2014. And we see that for a large number of countries, the share of services in total export has expanded significantly. Um, the, the, um, the mix of services is also, is also changing and we document that in the, in the chapter. We also document the role that services uh, play in, uh, within manufacturing because a, a, a larger content of manufacturing is now, now comprised of, of, of services. But the other uh, important piece of information is that barriers to tr international trade and investment in services are much larger than in the goods uh, sectors. And moreover, they are very high, uh, particularly in developing countries. So there is scope for increased tradability of services with uh, the right uh, policy action. Um, the second concern of the possibilities of, for the possibilities of services to absorb workers going forward is skills. Uh, there's a perception that you know, services are much more skill intense. So there might not be uh, sufficient skill labor in the, in the economy to, uh, to drive an, a further expansion down, down the road. Um, and that is a concern for some of the, of the top performing services, but not, not for all. If we look, for example, at the top tier in terms of the, we rank service industries in terms of the growth of productivity in the recent past, and we, top, the, we take the top tier, we find that it's not that different from manufacturing in terms of skill intensity. Some are, finance, business activities are, but not all. I mean, several of the trade sec, uh, services have shown high productivity growth and the skill intensity is not that different from manufacturing. The, the services that are really skill intense are the ones that, at least in the way we measure productivity in services, tended to be low productivity growth, health, education, and uh, public administration. But I mean, regardless of these findings, of course, skill development will be a top, a top priority for, for this to be, to continue this uh, going forward. So in terms of the implications from disappearing jobs in advanced, disappearing manufacturing jobs in advanced countries, um, what we do in the chapter, I mean, this is not a chapter on inequality. Uh, that has to be clear. We just looked at one angle and we wanted to, to test, to assess these two things, whether um, 
is it really the case that uh, income is higher in, in wages are higher in manufacturing than services and are more evenly distributed? So it's a more equal sector than, than services. And the other is whether part of what we see on the aggregate is explained by labor shifts across sectors. Um, so for that, we used uh, micro level data from uh, household surveys from about 20 advanced economies since the 80s. And uh, we found that if we look at um, wages, average wages, uh, they tend to be slightly higher in industry. We had to look at industry rather than manufacturing due to data limitations, but two thirds or more of industry jobs are manufacturing jobs. They tend to be slightly higher for the high skill segment and for the low skill segment in, in, in industry than services. Not by, yeah, by, but, uh, by the very large amount, but they are indeed, indeed uh, higher uh, for the 20 advanced economies for which we could have data. Um, we also found that um, la uh, labor income in uh, manufacturing is, uh, in industry is more evenly distributed. So labor inequality is slightly lower in industry than in services. You can see that in the right hand side chart by the fact that most countries are below the diagonal line. So they have lower labor inequality in services than, than in industry. But country characteristics matter a lot. I mean, if you, if you look at the country like uh, Denmark and you compare it with the US, you can see that labor inequality, both in services and in industry, is about one third of the level of labor inequality in the US. So the, the, um, the final exercise that we do when we do a bunch of different exercises to answer this question is we try to uh, assess to what extent aggregate inequality was driven by changes in, in, the, in the sector allocation of employment, and in particular by the decline in, in manufacturing. We start by a simple decomposition analysis that um, suggest, suggests that most of the change in the aggregate inequality was due to uh, changes in uh, inequality within sectors. Uh, about only 10-15% of the uh, increase in inequality in advanced countries can be explained by the uh, reallocation of, of jobs across, across sectors. We did other exercise. We took uh, um, we, we used the micro uh, data and uh, some assumptions on, uh, on the jobs that disappeared in manufacturing during the last 20 years. We assumed, for instance, that most were most skilled workers and uh, tried to assess what would have been the effect on aggregate inequality if all those jobs had moved to the low skill segment in, in, in services. And on top of that, they would have taken relatively low in, uh, wages in that sector and try to assess how much could have contributed of the aggregate uh, inequality. And the results on, on average are in the order of 9-10%, in the worst case, around 25%. So the conclusion is that uh, it does not explain a lot of the aggregate change in, in inequality. So let me uh, wrap up so we leave time for the discussion. Uh, our findings suggest that the decline in manufacturing job does not need to, to hurt uh, growth convergence or that is a main driver of uh, inequality. Of course, our findings do not mean that income growth of convergence is guaranteed regardless of whether manufacturing is expanding or, or not. And uh, there's a, a set of policy implications that we highlight in the chapter uh, in this regard. Uh, the first priority for, in, for developing countries, there are two set of priorities. One is to uh, remove obstacles to the reallocation of uh, resources towards the higher productivity sectors. And specific priorities on that regard have to do with removing barriers to entry uh, in services, behind the border barriers in the service sector, but also removing barriers to international trade and, uh, and uh, investment in services that would allow to boost the tradability of the sector. And then it would allow export of services to play an important role in, drive, in, 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 expand, in having a higher uh, absorption capacity, labor absorption capacity of the sector going, going down. The other aspect, as I mentioned before, is uh, skill development. I mean, working on ensuring that the, that the skill of the workforce is aligned with the needs of the more dynamic, dynamic sectors. The other uh, 
pillar of priorities for developing economies is working on reforms that boost productivity growth across the sector rather than focusing on, on individual sectors. Uh, as I show, showed before, in, uh, in some um, regions within sector productivity growth is very limited, like in South Southern Africa and Latin America. So there is a need to increase productivity across the board. There are some uh, some um, priorities there, like uh, promoting competition, uh, but there's a need for a, compre a comprehensive approach, including uh, improving the access to education and the quality of education, uh, improving physical infrastructure in some countries, and of course, improving business and investment climate. In advanced economies, um, even if our findings suggest that, that uh, most of the change in aggregate inequality is not due to the reallocation of of employment, the loss of the disappearance of manufacturing jobs uh, will affect segments of the population, and policies need to to tackle that. A uh, first priority is to facilitate, make uh, cheaper and, and and easier the the reskilling of displaced workers, facilitate the reallocation across sectors, including by helping on the regional mobility, which in some countries is a, is a big obstacle because, as you know. Manufacturing tends to develop in hubs, in regions, and then you know, when, when, when jobs disappear, there's a whole region that gets affected. And there will be workers that will be uh, particularly, uh, that the, the cost for some will be particularly large, so improving safety nets and redistributive uh, policies in general will have a, an important role to play. Let me close here. Thank you, Bertrand.